have your Bible, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 11? Mark chapter 11. Today, of course, is Palm Sunday. The day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem, also called the triumphal entry. A day that would usher in the reason why Jesus came. Of course, to die on the cross. And three days later, spoiler alert, we're going to celebrate it this Sunday. Jesus doesn't stay in the grave. And so what takes place on Palm Sunday is actually the very event that ushers in what we'll be celebrating this weekend with Good Friday services and Easter Sunday services. And so I want to take a look at this story in Palm Sunday and talk to you about how if you live for the approval of people, it will deter you from what God has called you to do. And so I want to share a message with you that I'm entitled, and you can write this down, don't live for likes. Don't live for likes. And would you pray with me? And let's prepare our hearts for what God wants to speak to us today. Lord, we look forward to what you want to give to us today from your word. God, we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to work within our lives personally, to give us fresh revelation and illumination to your word. That this text wouldn't be the same thing that we've heard so many times before, but today that you would give us fresh application to our lives. Lord, whether there's some here today that don't know you, some here today that perhaps are Lord, newer to following you or maybe some here today that have been walking with you for years or decades even. Lord, no matter where we are each at, we pray that you would meet us where we are at. And Lord, give us eyes to see you clearly from your word. But more importantly, a heart to receive what you would want to speak to us today, that it would transform and change our lives in such a way that we would go forth from this place, living the lives that you've called us to live and doing what you've called us to do. Speak now, for your church is here to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. There is something that is newer to society that... Our current generation is totally involved in, and that is the age of social media. Do you realize that over half of the world's population is on social media? I was doing some research earlier this week, and there was over 2.9 billion people, with a B, billion, on Facebook. 2.9 billion people on Facebook, 2.5 billion people on YouTube, 2 billion on the WhatsApp, 1.5 billion on Instagram, and the list goes on and on and on. And social media is newer to society, and the current generation is growing up in as the new norm. But although social media is newer as a medium or a platform, in which we are experiencing, what is not new is the desire and craving that humanity has had from the beginning of time for approval and to be liked. You see, approval is something that's within us that we all desire. They found that approval or words of affirmation are one of the five one of the five ways that we feel love and, and everyone desires to feel love and God has created us in such a way where we desire to be in a love relationship so that desire would lead us to a relationship with him. And so we have within all of our human nature a desire to be approved of, to be loved, to be liked. And society desiring to have that itch met, that desire fulfilled, how many people approve or like what I do? And so with that, in the days in which we live, we see people living for likes. 
there was an article in a huge news report about a woman who was an influencer and a social media model and She had an emotional breakdown because, well, her post that apparently she worked so hard on was removed. And so people couldn't like it. And because people couldn't like her and she got so much validation from being liked and approved on social media, she had this nervous breakdown, became depressed and said, and I quote, I have no reason left to live. And you read things and see things like that and you realize the world desires for the approval of people. Now, whether you're on social media or not, what is happening isn't new. We all like to be liked. Maybe you've gone somewhere and you've seen somebody with a camera and another person on side of the camera. You know, they're they're doing all those pictures and their poses and all of those things that they do, you know, to get the right angle with the coffee cup, you know. And, And you see these people. It's bizarre. I remember my wife and I, we were at a parking structure of this outdoor mall and there was these girls in, in, in uh, the parking structure with some lights and cameras set up and they're doing these dances, you know, and it's like... And you're like, what are you doing? And so I just kind of stood there and with my wife and and uh, kind of observed and made some comments and then made fun of them to their faces and uh, and joked with them a little bit. But it's it's bizarre in the world that we live in with social media. So many people desiring to be liked. And and so you have to take twenty four hundred photos to get the one with the right angle and you know and and you see that you know ladies I know what you do we all know what you do and you know you you take a photo but the way that you have to pose for the photo you know you have to turn sideways because it's slimming and 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 the hand has to be on the hip because you know it, it contours the back of the arm in a greater way and then and then the front leg has to be up on the toe because well well, that's, that's thinning, and, and, then, and then your chin has to be up, but not too high, and then look, and then smile. And we know. We know what you're doing. And when we take all these photos to get, oh, let me look at it. No, I don't like that one. Can you take a couple more? You know, you got to find the right person. You've ever been out with some friends, and you want someone to take your photo, and you see someone walk by, you ask them. No, no, don't ask them. They don't look like they know what they're doing. we got to find the right person. And so many times, you know, we put on this facade, really, you know, and if it's not the poses, well, then it's the filters, you know, the filters nowadays. Oh, my goodness. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, God bless you. But the filters nowadays, they have these filters that will literally change the face of a person so much that there's words been invented to describe what's taking place called catfishing. When someone presents themselves looking one way but looks completely different, and so you have these filters and usually one's not enough anymore. Now you got to like double the filters up. You got two, three, four filters. And then if it's still not a redeemable photo, well, then there's like animal faces. You know, oh, my nose looks funny in that photo. I just got to put like bunny ears and a bunny nose on it. You know, then it won't look as bad. And you're laughing. If you're laughing, you know it's true. If you're not laughing, you're crying because you know it's true. And so we have these things because why? Well, we all desire to be liked. You know, I don't think anybody here, you know, would say, you know, I don't really care to be liked. Actually, you know what, Pastor? I love to be hated. You know, how many here with a show of hands would say, you know what, I love to be hated? Yeah, I didn't think so. And if that is you, then there's going to be some pastors and elders available for prayer after service up in the front. You should be the one coming up and getting prayer because that's not normal. You know, get some counseling because no, one's, no one walks into a room and says, you know, I hope everybody hates me. I hope my wife hates me. I hope my kids hate me. I hope everyone in the workplace hates me. I just love to be hated. That's not us. No, our nature is we, we, we love to be loved. We like to be liked. And nowadays, well, those likes come in all different shapes and sizes. For those that are on social media, well, those likes can look like a heart. If you use the platform Instagram, well, you know, you love when people love your stuff. And so we do all of these things and we post it and and then all the poses and filters. Why do we go through all of that effort to get the picture just to post it? Why? Because we want people to tell us how much they like us. 
We want to do things that other people will like. You know, hashtag blessed. Hashtag tell me how much you like me. You know, oh girl, you look good in that photo. You know, your girlfriend say, or dude, you know, man, that, the lighting in that photo, man, you look buff in that photo. Hashtag jacked for Jesus. Why do we do this? Why? It's to get the approval of people. And, and we're so consumed with the approval of people in the days in which we live. If it's not the heart emoji, well, then the like can come in different shapes and sizes. It might be a thumbs up if you're a Facebook user. Posting things that people will like. Do you like what I'm saying? Give it a thumbs up. Do you, do you like what I'm doing? Tell me how much you like me. And the more people approve of what we do, well, the more that we'll keep doing it. But I wanted to tell you today, don't base the value of what you are doing on the amount of people that like it. Because it might be valuable to people, but it might not be valuable to God. And what is valuable to God might not be valuable to people. You know, you might be serving in ministry and maybe nobody knows about what you're doing. You're serving behind the scenes and not a, people, a lot of people are even appreciating it. Not a lot of people are liking it. Why? Because you're not, you know, posting it, you know, cleaning up church. Let me get my reward on earth. No, you might just be serving behind the scenes, but we can become discouraged with what we are doing because we think maybe more people should like what I'm doing. If people like it, well, then I'll keep doing it. If people don't like it, well, then I'm not going to do it anymore. And this carries throughout all of culture and society. A movie that, you know, you like, well, it didn't do so good in the box offices, so it wasn't really liked very much by the masses. So we're not going to make the next one. I remember my wife and I, we went and saw a movie and we, we loved the movie. It was so great. The only thing I didn't like about it is it left you like on a cliffhanger. Like the story wasn't over. And they set it up for the second one. You know, obviously they're going to make another one. But then because it did so bad in the box offices, they said they're not going to make another one. So we watched this movie that we loved and the story, you get all involved in it. And then you don't even get to see the rest of the story. And you're like, what are you doing? People didn't like it. So, well, I liked it. Well, we don't care about you. Well, thank you. <laughs> they do it with TV shows. They'll sign them on for another s season because, you know, it's popular. People are liking it. It's not just social media. It's not just media. It's in every aspect of society where people live for likes. But what I want you to see today, that if you live for the approval of people, it can keep you from fulfilling your calling that God has placed on your life. Let's take a look. It's in our text today in Mark chapter 11. I want to look at the Palm Sunday story from perhaps a, a little bit different of a perspective. You know, Palm Sunday comes around every single year. And if you've been in church for any length of time, you know, it's Palm Sunday again. And you're used to having, a, you know, the Palm Sunday message. But I want to look at it from a different perspective today. In, in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, I want to read to you the entire story and then we'll make some comments on it. But it says in verse 1 of Mark chapter 11, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he, Jesus, sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Notice this, that Jesus tells them that they're going to find a colt that no one has rode before. Interesting, because that's what Jesus can do in our lives. You see, a donkey would have to be broken, trained to have someone on its back. This donkey had never been ridden before. It was not trained. It was unusable. But what is unusable can be used by Jesus. Maybe in your life you thought, I don't think God can use me after what I've done or how broken I am or the failures I've had in my past. Maybe God can't use me anymore. And I wanted to tell you today, if God can use a donkey, then God can use you too. <laughs> then it goes on to say in verse three, and if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. 
Now, this is kind of funny if you realize what's going on. Jesus sends his disciples to go and take a donkey that doesn't belong to them. And then if anybody questions why you're taking it, probably the owners, just tell them the Lord has need of it. I would think it would be better to change the order. Go and tell somebody that the Lord has need of it and then loose it and take the donkey. But that's not the order Jesus gives it in. Why? Because it would take faith and obedience on both parties. For the disciples to do something radical as this and for the people that find the disciples doing something as radical as this, that they would say yes. It would be equivalent to this. You get up in the morning to go to church this morning and you walk out to your driveway and you find someone hot wiring your car. What are you doing? Don't worry, brother. The Lord has need of it. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you what the Lord has need of. <laughs> and okay, yeah, go ahead, take it. The donkey was a form of transportation. But the Lord had a divine appointment. And so they stepped out in obedience. And, and then it goes on to say in Mark chapter 11 in, in verse 4, So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. Notice that, that when they obeyed God, what God told them to do, they found it exactly as he said it would be. When we obey what God tells us to do, even if it seems crazy and it's crazy obedience, when we do what God tells us to do and confirms it in his word, we'll always find it to be exactly what God said it would be. And so they found that donkey, verse five, but some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colts? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, mass amounts of people gathered on the streets, waiting and wondering, would Jesus come? And they were waiting and wondering for two reasons. Previous to this story that we're reading, Jesus just resurrected a man named Lazarus from the dead. When Jesus resurrected Lazarus, many people who knew that Lazarus died and saw that he died saw that he's now living, and many people, that was the final thing that caused many people to place their faith and believe in Jesus. Well, Caiaphas, the high priest, the religious leader in Jerusalem, who is also a witness of this, he prophesied, the gospel say that he prophesied unknowingly. And he said that this man must die to save the nation. What he meant by that, though, is if we're going to save our nation, this man has to die. But what Jesus was planning and putting into place was that Jesus was going to die to save the nation from their sin. Not only the nation, but the entire world and all those who would believe in him. And so the religious leaders were planning and plotting, preparing to kill Jesus. They left that moment and started planning and preparing to kill him. So people are wondering, is Jesus going to show? You know, the air is pretty thick. Things are pretty tense right now in Jerusalem. You know, people are wondering and watching to see if he's going to show up. But the second reason that they're going to wonder and, and watch to see if he would come is because Daniel prophesied. Their scriptures, Daniel prophesied. A prophecy from the time that King Xerxes would decree that the people of Israel could come back to their homeland the exact day from that decree that was recorded, there would be an exact day that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. That day took them to this very day in that moment. Hundreds upon hundreds of years later, and then Zechariah would prophesy that the way that he would come, over 400 years earlier, Zechariah would prophesy that Jesus or the Messiah would come riding on a colt of a donkey. 
And so how Jesus would come, when Jesus would come. And so they were watching and waiting, wondering, would the Messiah come? And this would be one party that Jesus wouldn't miss. And the reason why is Jesus knew by accepting the praises of the people, it would usher in the time that had come. You see, throughout Jesus' life, when Jesus would do a mighty miracle, he would tell the people, tell no one about this. Don't tell them about this. My time has not yet come. He, it wouldn't stop him from doing what he needed to do, but he would constantly tell people to keep it to themselves. Now, would they do that? Oftentimes they wouldn't. They would go tell the world about it because when God does something so great in your life, you just can't be quiet about it, amen? You just have to tell the world what God has done in your life. And if God has done something powerful in your life, then we ought to be those that just can't keep quiet about it. And so Jesus would say, my time has not yet come, but now his time had come. Jesus would ride in on that donkey and then the people would gather and they would lay down their, their outer garments, their robes, their, their jackets on the ground. It was a sign of homage, paying royalty. You see, it was called a triumphant entry in that day culturally that if a king came back from his conquest victoriously, then there would be a celebration in the streets that our coming king has been victorious. And so they would lay down their clothes and they would take leafy branches, most likely palm fronds, and they would cut those off the tree and then use those and wave those around. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. And they would lay those down and lift their palms and, and raise their palms to worship the king. I wonder today if the Lord wants to ride into your life victoriously. I wonder if we would learn from these about our coming king. If we could raise our palms and worship and praise God too. Raising your palms, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, man, raising our palms. Well, I don't have a, a leafy branch. Well, you have two palms on your hands. We can raise our palms and worship the Lord too. The sign of surrender, accepting him as our king, riding victoriously into our lives. And so that's what they did. They accepted their savior. And so you could say at this time, as the masses would gather, that Jesus had tens of thousands of followers. You could say that there's a lot of people liking what he's doing. They're liking what they're seeing. And if you could imagine that social media was in that day, that, you know, or the internet was in the days of Jesus, you know, could you imagine you know, scrolling on your news feed? And, and then all of a sudden you come on your news feed and it says, oh, Jesus heals the masses. Everyone that came to Jesus was healed. Oh, you know, I like that. Uh, I like that. Too blessed to be stressed. Thank you, Jesus. Or, or what about this one? Jesus brings a dead man named Lazarus back to life. Well, I like that. Hashtag can't keep me down. <laughs> Hashtag YOLO, you only live once. Unless you're Lazarus, then I guess you live twice. <laughs> Jesus was getting a lot of likes at that time in his ministry. And the reason why is because what Jesus was doing was in unison to what the people wanted him to be doing. Imagine reading the headlines of the newspaper if there was one in that day. I don't know, maybe like the Jerusalem Times. Jesus, source close to Jesus says, he is the Messiah. Or the Judea Post, could this be the king we are waiting for? And, and you realize at this time, the crowd was crowning him as their king. You see, this, this shout that they were exclaiming, Hosanna, it means save now. Save us now. And what they were exclaiming to save us now from, you are our king, was from the Roman rule and reign over them. They were subjects to the Roman Empire. 
They didn't like that. For several reasons I won't get into today, one for capital punishment that was taken away and a nation loses their sovereignty when they have the inability to enforce their own laws. And so they would have to hand them over to the Roman courts for capital punishment. That's why Jesus was handed over to the Romans because the Jewish leaders were not allowed to carry out their capital punishment. And so they didn't have their own sovereignty anymore as a nation. And so they wanted to be free from being subject to the Roman rule. And so they were accepting Jesus as their king because they believed he was going to be the man, the Messiah, who would come to deliver them. He was the conquering king. Prophecies spoke of the Messiah that when he would come, he would be the conquering king. But what they didn't understand that we know today is that when it talked about the coming of Jesus, there's two comings. Jesus' first coming and his second coming. In Jesus' first coming, he came as the suffering servant, the lamb who would be slain to take away the sins of the world. We see John the Baptist give us that very definition of who Jesus is when Jesus first comes onto the scene. That is who he is, and that's why he came in his first coming, to save the world, not from the world system, but from our own need of a savior, from our own sin. And that's why Jesus came. But they didn't understand that there was a first coming and a second coming. And so when it came to the Messiah, there was prophecies about a suffering servant. No, we don't need that one. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just believe the ones that say he's a conquering king. And so they wanted Jesus to save them now and we'll follow you if you do what we want you to do. But that's not why Jesus came. And so when Jesus followed through on the purpose in which he came, note this, watch this, see this. The same crowd that was gathering on the streets of Palm Sunday exclaiming, Hosanna, save now, was the same crowd on Good Friday that was shouting, crucify him. The crowd is fickle. The crowd will change. Popularity can change based upon what people like, what, whether people like what you are doing or not doing. The crowd went from cheering to jeering. And the crowds will always be fickle based upon what you are feeding them. When Jesus was feeding them what they wanted, well, then they liked Jesus. But when Jesus came and accomplished what he came to do, then the crowd turned on him because he wasn't doing what they wanted. You could say that they were no longer giving him the thumbs up or the heart emoji. You could say that they were giving him this angry face emoji. Maybe you've seen that one before. Don't like that. You know, the angry face. Not happy about that. Don't like that. Don't approve of that. And Jesus, well, Jesus wasn't deterred from what he was supposed to do by whether the people approved of what he was going to do. You see, Put yourself in Jesus' shoes, or should I say sandals, for a moment. If people's approval was the motivating factor in Jesus' life and ministry, Jesus would have never made it to the cross. If the approval of people was the very thing that Jesus wanted and was living for, he would have never made it to what he was created or lived for. He wasn't created, but what he came for. The amount of likes Jesus was getting didn't detour him from what he was doing. Aren't you happy that Jesus didn't come to save humanity based on what other people were going to like or think about it? Aren't you glad that the salvation that Jesus has offered to you isn't dependent upon what people thought about it? But that he was committed to fulfill the plan of the Father. So let me ask you today, what is your motivating factor in all that you do? 
in the husband or the wife that God has called you to be, the single person that God has called you to be, the parent, the father, the mother, the grandparent, the employee, the ministry worker serving in the place of worship. What is your motivating factor in all that you do? Is it for the approval of the group or the approval of God? Is it for the approval of man or is it for the approval of the most high? Because I'll tell you, if it's for the approval of man, if it's for the approval of the group, then when you aren't thanked for doing what you do, when you're not liked for doing what you're doing, it won't be worth doing it anymore. And living for the approval of people can keep you from your calling. It can keep you from what God wants with you and for you and what he wants to work through you. See, what we often want is the approval of the masses, like Jesus had, you know, the tens of thousands of likes, you know, that, that, that icon where we get, you know, a lot of people approve of this, so I'm going to do this, but all we really truly need is the approval, the like of one. It's the like of Jesus Christ. It looks like this, just one heart, one like, one thumbs up, as long as God tells me this is what he wants me to do. It doesn't care, I don't care what people might think. They might not understand my calling. They might not understand what God wants me to do. It might not be popular, but I'm gonna do it anyways. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, that same crowd was cursing him spitting on him, mocking him. But it didn't deter Jesus from what he knew he was called to do. So let me ask you again, what's your motivating factor in all that you do? What we do or don't do cannot be based on whether people are going to approve of what we are doing. Galatians puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 10. For I am now seeking, for am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Notice that it's always one or the other. Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul, the apostle, says this in Galatians. If you want to, have the approval of people, you're not gonna have the approval of God. But if you live for the approval of God, you know, oftentimes you're not gonna have the approval of people. Jesus put it this way, a servant is not greater than his master. If they hated me, they're gonna hate you also. And that's a promise that a lot of us don't have underlined in our Bible. They're gonna hate me for sure. Okay, that's a promise of God. God, I'm gonna bank on this promise. We don't underline that and have that highlighted, but the fact of the matter is, if we are a follower of our master, our Lord, then there's gonna come to a point in our lives where people aren't gonna like you because you're doing what's right. Now, that does not give you an excuse to be not liked because you're just a jerk. Let me just say that. Oh, no one likes me, you know, because I'm a Christian. No, no one likes you just because you're rude. Like, okay, that's not, that's not what I'm saying here. But there's gonna come a point where people don't approve what you're doing because they won't understand what you're doing because they don't have the relationship with God that you do. And Paul says this, if I were still trying to please man, meaning at one point in his life he was, at one point of Paul's life he was living for the approval of man. But he says, if I still was trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Listen, the thing that will keep you from serving Jesus in the way that God intends and created and has designed for you to serve him the thing that will keep you from that, of being a servant of Christ, is desiring the approval of man more than the approval of God. If all you care about is the approval of God, then it won't matter who sees what you do. If you desire the approval of God, you can serve behind the scenes with no one noticing. You know, a lot of people see the pastor up on stage and, and you know, certain people that are in public views of, of ministry, but you know who I really believe gets most of the reward? 
It's the person that's preparing the crafts for the kids' ministry throughout the week. It's, it's the person that prints out the coloring sheets so that the little ones are able to experience Jesus at their level. It's the person that, that serves behind the scenes, that's never seen, rarely thanked, underappreciated, but they stay faithful week after week, year after year. Why? Because they realize God knows, God sees, and what I do in secret, God will be a rewarder of openly. If it's for people, you're going to miss out on your purpose. God has a calling on your life. He's created you with a specific plan to accomplish in and through you. But I think so many times we can never step in and never get to where God wants us to be because we care more about what other people around us think than what God thinks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Oftentimes, our motivating factor in all that we do can be for the approval of people when the purpose in which we are created is to live for God's glory, for his pleasure, we are created. You see, Jesus' mission was to come to seek and to save the lost. And whether you recognize that or not, whether I get noticed for doing it or not, I'm going to do that whether people like it or not. Because the amounts of likes that Jesus received didn't deter him from what God called him to do. Jesus didn't do what he came to do for the approval of people. It was for the approval of God. And the amount of likes or approval that you get shouldn't deter you either from what God is calling you to do. You know, I've had people try to counsel me and say things, you know, like, are you sure you want to do that? How do you think the people are going to respond? And I say, it doesn't really matter what the people think or how the people will respond. What matters is my obedience to do exactly what God has called me to do. That's what matters. And people that are following the Lord will see that it's what God wants to accomplish because it's what God is speaking and how God is leading. You don't need the approval of man when all you're living for is the approval of God. If you live for the approval of people, it will deter, discourage, and dissuade you from what God has for you. So church today, do what God has called you to do. You've been chosen, you've been called, and you were created to live for Number one, the Lord and the Lord only. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And for your pleasure, can I say, we were and are created. The Lord has created us for his purposes and for his plan. And let me end by saying that when we live for our purposes or for our plans, we can miss out on God's very best for our lives. If we live for the likes of what other people might think or what other people might approve of, we'll never be faithful to what God has called us to do. When I pulled into the parking lot early this morning, long before most everyone was here, there were two men standing in the parking lot, ready and waiting to welcome people as they would come in. Why, why does someone come early, no matter if it's a 110 degree day or if it's a 40 degree cold morning, why, why does someone come and stand in the parking lot? Why? Because they're more concerned about what God thinks than what man thinks. Why, why does someone serve to the kids when, when you know, no, one, no one really sees and gets to really get a, you know, be 
pat it on their back for when, they, when they're faithful in teaching the little ones. No, no one really, you know, gets a lot of exposure teaching third and fourth graders. Why do they do that? Because they care more about what God thinks than what man thinks. Why do you continue to serve the Lord? To make it a point to come to church on Sunday mornings, to sit at the Lord's feet on the first day of the week, in the first moments of the day, giving the Lord your first fruits. Why is that important? Because we care more about what God thinks than what man thinks. People don't understand it. Why do you go to church? And you go to church, you, you not only go to church on Sundays, you go on Wednesdays too. What's wrong with you, man? They don't understand, do they? That a desire, they don't understand the desire to want to sit at the Lord's feet, to gather with his people, to worship the Lord, to study his word. They don't understand. And so if you live for the approval of people, it will keep you from the calling. But if you live for the approval of God, you'll be faithful. And one day, my prayer is for each of you that you'll hear those words one day when we enter into God's presence who sees what we do in secret and rewards openly when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. May, be, may that be the prayer of our hearts this day as we live for the approval of God not the approval of people. Jesus went through. The crowd is fickle. The crowd changes. Save us now. You're not going to do it the way that we want you to do it. Then, okay, crucify him. And people might go from praising your accomplishments to being the first ones that talk bad behind your back about you. People change. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is the one that we need to live for. And so, Lord, we ask.